enjoy the benefits of that. So I'm really here uh, today to join in on all of the words uh, that the speakers have made uh, that say this is the single moment in time where we can make this happen. Thank you very much, Ed. Greatly appreciate those, those optimistic words. Okay, next we've got Destiny Thomas. Destiny is working with uh, the NICE program in Walnut Hills, an exciting new voice and uh, really, really impactful. So Destiny, would you please share your opening remarks and thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I've worked in communications, PR, marketing world. Um, and as of uh, 2020, I've kind of bailed from the corporate space a little bit, um, which will be interesting to talk about here and, and kind of how that ended up happening. Um, but I've worked in the art space for a long time, um, artworks, worked on Blink, uh, I said Brendan Cole in this one. Um, and yeah, I've started a new organization called Sensi Nice that's really about creating spaces where people can feel like they can be them, themselves and um, where some of these more diverse um vulnerable conversations can happen um and i'm excited yeah i i feel like i am a new voice because it wasn't until i started my own business that is black owned and women owned that i started being seen as an activist and i kind of challenged what that what that means um yeah so i'm excited to talk about it great thank you very much destiny and then we have uh lauren worley who uh has a diverse background she was in politics worked in the the Senate with, with me for a bit, uh, is uh, was at Cincinnati Public Schools and is now at Procter & Gamble. So Lauren, please. Thank you, Senator Kearney, I appreciate that. I'm so thrilled to be with everyone today. And as Eric noted, I've primarily worked in campaigns and government and whether you can tell from my accent or not, I'm an, I'm an Appalachian, I'm a hillbilly. And um, you know, I think what Ed said about the importance of being truth tellers, uh, really, really spoke to me this morning. And I think people with my cultural upbringing, uh, people have a thought about what that is and hillbilly elegy has not helped us. Uh, but I think to Destiny's point, um, you know, we have to, we have to speak up um, in whatever community we find ourselves. Um, and we have a moment, as others have said, you know, we, we know about the pandemic moment we're all in, but we also are experiencing a global moment in terms of climate change and the moment we find primarily here in the United States, but it's throughout the world in terms of the social justice work that must be done. And I'm full of hope that we can actually, maybe it's easier for us to take all those things on at once as opposed to um, trying to do them in, in bits and parts because they all must be handled at once. And so I'm looking forward to talking uh, with, with this great group today. Thank you so much, Senator, I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so the first question we're gonna get right into it is, or the first prompt, uh, can you share an instance where you had to lead, instruct, guide your organization, current or past, uh, on a social justice issue? And it's open to the entire panel. So panel, jump in as, as you see fit, as you are inspired. I'm gonna call on people. Okay, Christy, let's go. <laughs> so not fair, I was first in the beginning. So, you know, I'll, I'll the one that's probably most prominent is um, after the murder of George Floyd, I was part of the team um, that was putting together the organization's response, both externally and internally. And, you know, obviously you want, we wanted to get together immediately. And so it, there wasn't time as an individual, I was grieving um, the situation, but professionally I was being asked to put that grief aside and craft a message around the situation. And, you know, I went into that mode and was beginning to draft, you know, help draft statements and things of that nature. And I received an email. Um, so as I said earlier, I work on the social determinants of health and with uh, working at UC Health, you know, one of the main things that we saw right away with the pandemic was the disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. And specifically we were seeing um, disproportionate deaths, infection rates, and reactions in the Black community. And at a, at a certain point, we also started to see that in the Hispanic community. 
And we saw it um, really in Price Hill as well as Avondale, a predominantly Hispanic population in Price Hill, predominantly African-American uh, population in Avondale. And I had requested some information from different teams so that as I was working with our community organizations on the disproportionate impact, I had the right information to help develop a strategy with our organizations. And some people got back to me right away and some people did not. And obviously we're working on a global pandemic. So it's understandable that folks may not be able to respond timely, but people are dying, right? So when the, the murder of George Floyd happened, um, someone who I reached out to to get information on the disproportionate impact um, sent me an email, responded to the email that I sent about a month ago, um, trying to work on the impact, say, oh my gosh, you know, let's, you you know, these numbers are, are what they are and, you know, let's, let's work on it. And so when the team came together to craft the message, you know, and Veda knows, you know, <laughs> I always hate to be that person that 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 has to say it, but I said, well, hold up. Black lives mattered before George Floyd was murdered. And before we craft this statement, I want to know why these lives didn't matter enough for me to get a response a month ago. And, you know, I was very emotional um, because when you for for everyone watching that video we saw different things you know i saw my brother in law my my father my son on that ground um with having the life choked out of them but i also saw the numbers on the spreadsheets in avondale and price hill of black and brown lives that were dying every day as a result of this pandemic um, no, it wasn't at the hands of the police, but it was at the hands of the same social justice injustices that are occurring in society every day. So we are losing lives, not just because police officers, um, you know, are, are, are having these, these, these shootings and these killings, but we're losing lives every day because society has not addressed systemic racism systemic racism killing people every single day. And before I can craft a statement about the murder of George Floyd, I want us to recommit to addressing systematic racism that's killing my people and my brothers and sisters in, in, the, in the Hispanic community and other communities of color every day. Because if you just want me to speak out about one murder and not pay attention to the significant deaths that are happening across the country every day for social ills um, across the board, then I'm not willing to sign up for that. And so, you know, as, as, and as a professional, particularly a person of color in an organization, when you have to feed your family, it's hard to have those conversations because when, you know, when it's time for folks to be on the chopping block, you assume that your name's gonna be on there and how do I feed my own children? How do I pay my own bills? But I made the decision when I worked for um, a company and they closed their local office. And so my position was eliminated then and I was able to survive. And that actually led to me serving in the state house that, you know what, if I lose my job, I'll be OK. And it, it, it was no longer worth it for me to keep my mouth shut to keep a position. And so I said some really hard things during that time to, to people from the CEO on down. And luckily for me, I work in an environment where that information was appreciated and acted upon. And my CEO, um, Dr. Lofgren, is very open to these issues and has always been, even before this, the, the murder. And so that's my long-winded example, sorry, um, uh, Senator Kearney, if, it's, if it was way too long, to say, you know, these are very complicated issues. And um, that's, that's one instance where, you know, I had to say some tough things and call some people out, um, but that was the only way I was able to, to get through it authentically. Thank you for sharing that, Christy. I, I greatly appreciate it. Would others like to share their their personal experience? Yeah, I'll hop in real quick, Eric. Um, okay. I think it's kind of an interesting one for me because it wasn't until kind of looking at your questions this morning that I realized that uh, I have never worked in a place with anyone that is not. I've always been the only minority at everywhere I've worked, and I'm going into 11 years of my career. Um, 
And I really think looking back that I saw everything um, that I was doing as some level of social justice, whether it's like, let's try and hire that black photographer instead of using the same person you've used for six years, or maybe there's other snacks we can put in the office that aren't the same snacks. Like I think all of those little, I see someone's asking about like, what are small things we can do? And it's like, I look at all of these things that are through every part of the decision-making, even like the intentionality. Um, and so I always saw that as part of one, just who I am, but also that is that working against social justice in some sense of like, how do we start to shift every piece of what we do? Um, whether it be maybe that speech shouldn't be written by the normal speech writer and you need to have it be co-written because you don't really know what you're talking about. It's not gonna come from the heart because you don't, you haven't experienced it. Um, whether it's time for someone else to step back and someone else to you know, be in that meeting. It's like all those smaller decisions um, that take place. Um, and I don't think it was until I really uh, started working for myself and I saw how we were making decisions um, that I saw how much impact that could have within an organization and how crucial it is um, that there's someone there working on social justice, whether it's being called that or not. Um, that's just thinking in that way. Senator, I just want to build on what Destiny said because it really sp spoke to me and it's something that we had a chance to talk about yesterday. Before going to Procter & Gamble, I, I worked for two and a half years at Cincinnati Public Schools and public schools is a social justice movement. Public schools is based on the whole concept that we believe as a country, the public education should be open and fair and free for everyone. And fundamentally should be equal and, and accessible, full of opportunities. And it hasn't always been that way. And so to Destiny's point and building on, Christy, I feel like I kind of went to church this morning. You got me all around. <laughs> I'm sweating a little bit, I'm excited. We have to, in part of the little things that we do is seeking out that diverse vendor. If we get the slate of people and it doesn't show us you know, real diversity, we got to go back and ask for it with candidates we hire when we're doing events. Wait, is this on a Jewish holiday? <laughs> like, hold on a second. We just put that event during the day. Can working moms really get to that? And so, you know, as we think about what engagement is for whether it's our work, uh, certainly public schools, we thought about that a lot. If we are holding an event during business hours, we are not we are thinking of single moms who can stay at home and or, or not single moms, but mom, stay at home moms, essentially, right? We aren't thinking about working people generally or people who might work third shift. So we, we have to, to program that in our head. And that is a little thing we can do and challenge ourselves. Maybe it's as little as putting that post-it note on our, on our, our ball and say, who's not in the room right now? Who are we not hearing from? And I, I think that's, that's really important. Thank you, Christy and Destiny. That was great. Okay, uh, Veda and Ed, it's surprising to me that you haven't jumped in. You're never reticent that I know of. So please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Lauren, uh, you know, I always remind uh, people that it's not just black people who are poor. Uh, and I always remind them that we have a significant Appalachian community that's in poverty and uh, that culture uh, is an incredible force. It's hard to break out of uh, all of the habits and practices and policies uh, and to, to break the chain of something like poverty. Uh, and in fact, studies will show that uh, it takes at least eight generations to reverse uh, something like poverty uh, in a family uh, or in a neighborhood. So uh, I, I think we ought to be thinking about this in terms of uh, not just the uh, income gap, but also the wealth gap that's perpetuated by all these cultural uh, aspects and uh, look for solutions. Uh, and, you know, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center was an attempt to show 
one initiative, one significant, perhaps the first uh, significant initiative uh, toward justice uh, and uh, equity, equality. Uh, and we first started out by looking at what are the drive, what were the drivers uh, that led to that movement. And it turns out it, there are three significant ones, courage, cooperation, and perseverance. And so and when I say we're at a moment where courage, cooperation, and perseverance can work again to solve a major uh, problem that impacts all of us, not just black and brown people, but people of all color, colors and races are impacted by what I refer to as the beast. And uh, when I say this is a significant time, if you look at the nature of the protests, it's different. It's different from what happened uh, during the abolitionist period. It's different from what happened during the civil rights movement, uh, Martin Luther King. It is now everyone wanting to rid ourselves uh, of something that's holding us back. And so, you know, the little things really do count. The, really, the, the little changes in policy and practices and kindness uh, and cooperation and courage to speak up. Uh, those, those things are very, very important and need to be emphasized. And we should all put our backs to that. And we should all also all dialogue in a respectful manner so we understand what each other is experiencing and, and not put it down prematurely but support it. That's my lecture for today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Uh, Eric, I'm gonna build on what Ed is saying because it's, it's so important. And that is, at the end of the day, we're never going to make meaningful change if the only folks who are talking, who are preaching from the mountaintops are folks of color. And this concept of white allies is extraordinarily important. It's important because there are things that a white male can say that will, that will be taken differently, that will be taken more credibly, that won't necessarily get the unexpressed cynicism that would be the case if I said it. And part of what Ed is noting in terms of the literal complexion of the streets being different now versus in the 60s, that was critical. It is very important that this is not seen as just a black or brown or a yellow problem. At the end of the day, the country suffers if we can't get our act together, and the lives of whites will suffer if we can't get our act together. And I think the extent to which Gen Z sees it much more as a societal problem versus a problem for those folks is really critical in understanding how things have played out differently in the you know, seven months, six or seven months after George Floyd versus other periods in our history. Okay, let's let's move to a different prompt. Um, in, in your opinion, and, and please feel free panelists to share personal stories that you might have, is it difficult to balance your outs, out of, outside of work, political or social positions with the attitudes and opinions of your work environment. Now, I found this true when I was uh, uh, an attorney at, uh, at a law firm at which I worked. And so I just wondered, has that been your experience perhaps? And um, maybe some other people who are on the Zoom today. 
Um, so, so please have at it. Who, who, has, uh, who has some thoughts they'd like to share? Veda, I'm gonna pick on you since you aren't muted. So you can just talk. And look, at the end of the day, this all is intertwined. And frankly, part of what I think at times um, creates the additional physical sort of stresses of being black or brown and, or yellow in America is the fact that you can't separate these things. And it all is, it's all, it all comes together. Um, I just think someone said it earlier. There are two observations I would give you. Being, in many ways, being, uh, and I'll just speak to African American being a successful African-American in a corporate environment is an act of social justice. Because there is, and, and I'll, let me talk about my friend and go. There are not just lives of African-Americans that have been transformed because of Ed's personal sort of leaning forward involvement in leadership. But as if not more importantly, there are a lot of white folks who think differently about race because of their experience with Ed and folks who have taken it on themselves to drive change because of their experience with Ed and Ed being an example of what sort of real social justice and success looks like. And so, and this idea of the little things is so important because when you start peeling back the success of a lot of African Americans in the corporate sphere, it typically comes to a seminal moment where an individual sort of leaned forward versus leaned back and said, who are you? Tell me your story. How can I be of help? And I just think we should never underestimate the importance of individual impact. And it's both a burden, but it's also a real opportunity. And I think particularly in Cincinnati, where it's one degree of separation and everyone's related, quote unquote, what, looking for, looking at who are you going to impact? Who are you going to bring up? Um, is just, is so important. And it's a great example of someone who's lived that way. Yeah, so Ed, uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Why don't you describe some, some instances where you've brought people up and, and how, that, um, how that's a form of activism as, as uh, Veda has outlined. Well, Veda reminds me uh, of a story which uh, is, is actually been published uh, it was published in John Pepper's book called What Really Matters. And uh, in that, that uh, book, uh, John talks about, uh, you know, race and how Procter & Gamble was trying to deal with diversity. And uh, there was a, a, a person uh, who some of you know, uh, Lloyd Ward, who left the company, uh, African-American who was on the rise, was gonna be one of the top uh, officers of the company. And, and Lloyd left uh, suddenly and John called him and said, uh, you know, talk to me, why, uh, why did you leave? And uh, Lloyd said, John, because I did not feel like I was in the house. So think about our community. Think about those who don't feel like they're in the house. And, and as Veda says, lean forward sometimes in, in your zone of discomfort because the person is different and you don't really know them, you don't really trust them, but you have courage to lean forward 
and bring them into the house. So Beta, you know, my personal uh, uh, modicum of success came because of those individuals at Procter & Gamble who leaned forward and wanted to get to know me better. Uh, you know, and I'm uh, by nature a reconciliator. Uh, I have a conciliatory na uh, nature, uh, so that made it a little easier. But kind of think about those situations that aren't so easy and get your own personal courage going to lean forward and help that person cross over into uh, economic empowerment, health empowerment, educational empowerment. Thank you, Ed. Um, Destiny, it looks like you have something you want to add, so jump in. So Ed, Ed just mentioned the word trust, which I think has been the biggest piece for me. Um, you know, you asked about the balance between it. It's like I've been in positions before where I've been asked, you know, I noticed that you shared about the poverty issue in Cincinnati is that, you know, our clients are pretty conservative. Are you sure that you can do that here? And it's um, honestly offensive, <laughs> but it's like, you also don't trust me to be a professional and know when when's the right time to discuss things and when's not. And um, I think a lot of what um, we've been working on this summer with Cincy Nice, we hosted that event, Our Tables, um, which was really about how can we have conversations in a way. And, you know, we even went as far as inviting everyone who is black and a minority to show up there first as a way of saying, we trust you to lead this conversation and we believe that you should be. Um, and I, it goes into so many pieces of it. It's like, if I'm going to branch out and take, you know, I worked um, hosting journalists for a while. It's like, if I'm going to take them to a different restaurant, then, you know, you might like Via Vite and that's, that's a go-to and we know it's safe, um, but you have to trust me to take people out of their comfort space and to give me the ability to, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. If uh, that new partner that we hired to um, do the design work doesn't have the same level of account management as your other one, that's also okay. And I, you have the budget to kind of compensate for that. Um, and it's looking at all those different places where you have to have the trust um, to make the changes that are necessary. Um, and I just see that in so much of, you know, when I'm being hired <laughs> for a project. Um, and, you know, I even go as far as I don't actually use Facebook anymore. Um, I just don't think that it was a space that was productive for me as um, someone who wants to do freelance and contract work just because there would always be like, oh, I saw on Facebook that you reshared an article about income inequality. Are you, I think it's shifted you know, in 2020, but that definitely was a space where you would be asked about it in an interview or in some setting. It's like, I don't even, this isn't the time. And I also don't think it should impact and it should be something that um, I would hope would be uh, more important for, to have you on your team. Um, so I think it's navigating that trust issue and that's the core of, of so much uh, of this. You know, that is such a great point about resharing an article and suddenly that becomes your point of view on, on a whole host of things. So, so that's, a, that's a great, great point, Destiny. Okay, so Christy, I'm gonna pick on you. you you've been on a lot of, uh, you've worked in a lot of different uh, environments. Uh, some are pretty conservative, I would say, from my viewpoint. Others are probably more open. Um, so, so can you maybe uh, just talk about uh, talk about that? How how you've had to balance that a little bit? Sure. You know, started out in a in a, a, a law firm of a nice a nice size law firm here in town. Obviously, more on the you know typically be more on the conservative side. But um, in that space, I did um, labor law and employment and labor law, and so I was able to still really work for workers' rights and and the ability to have a fair wage and things of that nature. And so I think no matter where, where you are, what space you're in, there is an opportunity for you to advocate for um, social issues that are important to you. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to make political statements. I mean, just doing the work in and of itself um, helps lots of people. Um, as Veda said earlier about Ed, you know, the work that he's done um, for people who don't even know that he's opened doors for them. Um, you know, when I was 
um, involved in the African American Chamber and was on the board and and you know folks like Ed and others, I learned so much from them on on how you can effectuate change without having um, to to have your a loud bullhorn. Um, but it can be exhausting when you have a lot of um, community work outside of work and a demanding day job. And so, you know, I was serving on like 10 different boards and that's not even an exaggeration plus billable hours as a young attorney. And it was a lot. And so I decided that I wanted a career where part of my, my day job was to work on those same community issues that I was working on um, in my volunteer time. And that's why community relations at UC Health was really important because I knew that, you know, my job, my day job was to work on those, um, those health disparities that we see. And when I started there, I was in the state house. And so it wasn't a secret to, to my company that I was involved politically because I was an elected state representative the first year that I was at UC Health. Um, and, but, you know, I'm not at work um, pushing what I consider divisive issues. I'm at work championing fair wages, uh, health care for, for everyone being able to come in and get culturally competent care. And I don't consider those to be political hot buttons. I think everyone believes that when you come to a hospital, um, you should receive culturally competent care, that we should address disparities that we see in certain populations. And, um, you know, I had someone ask me at, at work one time, well, it looks like a lot of the work that you do is in black and brown communities in, in CR, you know. And I said, well, the, our, my job is to address health disparities and we see health disparities in black and brown communities, where should I spend my time? You know, and it's like, oh, look at the data. You know, it's like, why, why would I spend, if I'm, if I'm working on, you know, the disproportionate impact and, and outcomes and diabetes in, in the African-American community, shouldn't I start with working with the African-American community? Um, and sometimes people and people of color are afraid to say those things at work. And it's like, no, that's, that's, that's exactly what your job is, is to work on these issues. Um, but one thing I always say, and, and I'll, I'll be brief, is before you, because this is the world we live in, make sure that you have shown your value in your organization before you speak out on these tough issues sometimes. Because showing that you are good at your job, that you have a skill set that that organization needs, and that you truly understand the issues because you can be an advocate, but not even understand what you're advocating for. So make sure that you understand and that you're not speaking on behalf of someone that hasn't given you permission to speak on behalf of them. Um, make sure that you do all of those things first, because if you are not a value professional, it is a lot easier to say, ah, you know what, you're not the right fit. So establish yourself in the workplace as a value um, part of that company before you start to have those tough conversations um, because it gives you a better place of advocacy. You become a, a more trusted, um, a, a more trusted advocate, and it's more job security. Very great practical practical hey, advice there. Let, let, uh, let me let me yeah, just hold on jump one in, thing. and then we're going to go to Lauren. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm a brand guy. I'm all about the power of brand, and if you. One, there is uh, the, the concept of personal brand is extraordinarily important. In the concept of personal brand, there's no place where it's more important than Cincinnati, where everybody knows everybody, everyone's related to everybody. You know, it's all about where did you go to school and they're not talking college, they're talking high school. And so, Part of what I would say to folks listening, particularly if you are, and I'll just use Black in Cincinnati, and that's not to not say Hispanic, I'm just much more familiar with the travails of African Americans here in Cincinnati. How you build your personal brand is extraordinarily important. And being thoughtful, I mean, part of what Christy is saying is, have your act together. Don't get ahead of your skis. Don't, because I will tell you, part of the challenge in Cincinnati for African Americans is that at times we've not seen what good really looks like. Because we are, I think at times too, 
there's a lot going on in the in this big world to which we're not exposed. And you know, I'm a big believer in never subject someone to the bigotry of low expectations. You know, I'm gonna. It's important that we as African Americans get the honest feedback about us, our brands, how we come across, so that, that we're not sort of that proverbial person walking around naked and we're the only one who doesn't realize that. Okay. Um, so Lauren, I'd like for you to jump in. And one great thing about Lauren that people may not realize is she, she is really great at speaking uh, to powerful opinionated people and getting them to understand what they're supposed to say and what the reaction will be to what they have to say and uh, putting it in terms that are understandable to the community. And so um, with that skill set, I wonder if you could uh, talk about the balance that you've had to, you, you may have had to, uh, to have between the work and uh, your personal, personal views, that balance that we were talking about. Oh my goodness, I felt like I was on Oprah for a second there. I was like, the stories we, we, could, we could tell, right? Um, I wanted to underscore um, a point that I think my fellow panelists were making, which is that equality and fairness is not a political opinion. Equality and fairness is, is who we should be, aspire to be as people. The political opinions come in, which is like, uh, if I take the space agency, for an example, you know, should we have a 70 metric ton rocket or, or a 50 metric ton rocket? That's actually a political opinion. You know, should it be this or should it be that? But the fundamentals of who we should be and how we treat other people should be across the board. And it should be something that we expect from everyone, particularly what how the community in which we want to raise our kids. And Veda, you, you said it well, which was, you know, we ask what school you went to, and we don't mean Kent State or Miami or, or Harvard. We mean, you know, did you go to Princeton or Elder or, or, or uh, Walnut? And that's an asset to our community because it means most of our kids who grow up here want to stay here. They want to go to UC or Xavier, and then they want to stay here. And so, you know, Eric, you asked me about how, how do we, how do we kind of, as, as, a, as someone who's been a spokesperson and, and, a, and an advisor to people, I would say taking Veda and Christie's statements to heart here. I can't make an influence on an executive if I haven't done the work, if I haven't invested in understanding them and understanding where they come from. So um, for four and a half years, I was the senior advisor to the NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden. Look him up, he's an American hero. Uh, among the first eight African-Americans to the Naval Academy and the first black uh, administrator of NASA. And it was my job, uh, we, recommend, we represented the American people though, right? And so there would be times when I needed to help Charlie achieve a goal, but we can't deny who he was as an individual, someone who literally grew up in the segregated South, literally could not get an appointment to the Naval Academy because Strom Thurmond was his senator, right? So this is his literal experience. And yet now we live, you know, we want to use that and parlay that experience to bringing other people in. And I just think practically too is we all deserve to have someone we bounce ideas off of and we can be really um, honest with and say, I'm feeling this, I'm thinking this. But what what is incumbent upon all of us is to is to take in other points of view. If we are surrounded in a bubble of people who think like us, then we are not surrounding ourselves with the right people. It, is, it has been hard in this political election to see what probably some of our family members have said on Facebook, Destiny, you were smart to get off of it, right? I don't agree with those opinions, but it's important for me to understand that so that I can understand how I can begin to break through when I'm working with an executive, whether it's here in Cincinnati uh, or, or somewhere else to say, how can we not dilute, not change our message, but what are the words that we can use to break through, to help people understand that it's not a black problem. It's not, you know, Christy's a black woman who's a mother, right? It's not just her problem. Her, her, her problems are, are my problems. And 
and to tie that in a bow to why I think this is so important is we have to do this for our kids, right? We, this is their city. We are stewarding it for them until they grow up. They aren't going somewhere else. Our kids aren't moving to Chicago and LA, whatever. They want to live here. And I think that is terrific. But we have to stop acting like they're someone else's kids and start acting like they're our kids. And it's not schools that are good enough for them. The schools that are good enough for us and it's opportunities in our neighborhoods that are good enough for us. And I think, I think the people, I mean, we've got a great group. I can, I'm inspired by the hundreds of people on this call today and part of the symposium. And I think we can do that, Eric. I think we can do that, Senator, but it, it takes the little acts that we all talked about. It takes setting the example. It it's Christie's point about, you know, you, you got to do the work, right? You can't just have ideas. You got to do the work. And, and, you know, we got to listen to people like, like Destiny, who are like, hey, you know, I'm showing up like this every day. Younger, I'm a Gen Xer, but, but millennials and Gen Zers, they show up like who they are every day. They don't have a facade. They don't have a, you know, I'm something else at work and then I'm, and then I'm something, they're, they're their brand all the time, right, Veda? <laughs> they're who they are. And we got to recognize that. And that's how we can make some fundamental change, I think. Okay, so that's a great segue. So the facade and on brand that you just spoke about, Lauren, um, is that appropriate to bring into the work environment? Is that uh, is it is it a, is it appropriate to 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 do that? I mean, you're there to if you work for a for profit organization, you're there to create profits for the the shareholders yes. in theory. Hell yes, it's appropriate. okay. That is why. That's the whole point around diversity. If diversity is just about a bunch of folks who are not white going into an environment acting exactly the same as the white folks in the environment, well, what's the point? I mean, this is one where people need to be themselves. People need to feel comfort in being themselves. And at the end of the day, businesses are more successful when people are bringing different life experiences to the table and when everyone is exposed to new approaches in growing and evolving. This, and so the idea that all of this change, all of this sort of submission is put on the shoulders of black and brown people, it's ridiculous. That's why the Crown Act is so important. Women should be able to wear their hair how they want to wear their hair. And this idea that black hair is a political statement, well, if it is, then we need to support it. And so I do think also part of this dance that we're playing is in some boardrooms, Black Lives Matter is not a political statement. In other boardrooms, it's a political statement. You can't say that because it's you know this type of organization. In a lot of ways, just being Black in these environments is a political statement. And when you just accept that as gravity, it actually, I think, allows us to be more real and authentic and honest. Okay, Destiny, do you feel that you have to be, that you're on brand all the time and that you have a quote unquote facade as, as Lauren has said? Or do uh, I wish I was able to in some degree. My face always says exactly what I'm thinking. Um, so that is probably how I ended up here. If, you're, if I can, you know, if I don't feel like we're doing the right thing, it's always very clear on my face. Um, but I would say just to Veda's point, it's more than just like necessary, it is profitable. I mean, I've worked in communications for so long and I, I see so many of the choices that were being made um, or the great choices that we did make. And it's like, if you're trying to build relations with the public, you have to be able to have a relationship with them. And if no one on your team is able to build that relationship or that trust, then the PR is not gonna work, the communication strategy, none of those, nothing's going to come together. So um, you have to do it. And I, I just saw that Austin was kind of commenting on uh, in the chat, like as a young millennial, and 
Um, I would just say, I, you know, I just feel like we have to be more accepting of, and especially in Cincinnati, of just the freedom of what it looks like to just be a person. I think Cincinnati is still very, um, I don't know the right word for it, but it's just not as accepting to, you know, I want to show up and I want to wear a blazer that is full of colors and stuff. And then like, we still aren't in a space where that's acceptable. And, um, you know, I've always really intentionally sought out diversity in my life. I'm, I'm biracial. So I think I've had the advantage of being able to like navigate different worlds and, and tougher conversations. Um, but living in Miami, I went to school in Miami, Florida, and it was just like, why did I feel like I had to wear the white shirt and the blazer and the what? And it's like, we're limiting so many people from just feeling empowered in who they are as a person, let alone as a professional, let alone as an effective leader. Um, and so I think a lot of this is like, how do you just empower people to be themselves across the board, not just as a black person or like, we put a lot of people in boxes in Cincinnati, I think. And um, uh, how do we break those down? And I, I, I just see it being beneficial in all aspects of professional and personal lives here in Cincinnati. And people okay. will their job. <laughs> yeah, can, can I just ask Ed to, to comment mm -hmm. a little bit? Because uh, when Ed graduated from Xavier University in, uh, in Louisiana, things were, things were different when he was recruited to, to Proctor. So if you could talk a little bit about the quote unquote facade and being on brand at, uh, at work. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's been a, a changing aspect of my life. Uh, and, you know, I'm 77 years old. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, you know, Destiny's youth uh, and others on this panel. Uh, I've kind of gone through the gamut from initially being the only African-American uh, manager in R&D product development at Procter & Gamble, being the first and only, uh, all the way to, you know, owning my own business of several hundred million dollars. Uh, and so uh, I am now, like Destiny, com comfortable in my skin Whereas in 1965, I wasn't. Uh, and, you know, uh, Veda can speak to this as well. Uh, P&G has evolved, uh, not to where it should be yet, but uh, a big, big change since 1965. The first thing that happened was the company asked the African-Americans who came on board between 1965 and 1970, to take on the task of doing diversity training. Multiculturalism, it was called at the time. Uh, and so the African-American uh, managers were the trainers of diversity in the company, which was upside down. Uh, the time, the mood in the country at that time was, was very militant. Uh, you know, black power was, you know, the slogan. And, uh, these, uh, very, uh, intelligent individuals, African-American managers were asked to beat up their bosses to make them aware of how bad things are. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, I had to play roles. Uh, others had to play roles to get through. Uh, th there were so many incidences during the course of my career that finally caused me to understand I can be myself, I can be authentic uh, and not worry about it. But you also have to have some independent wealth to be able to stand up to changes like that. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, we, we're running out of time, as you as you can see. We've got less than <coughs> less than two minutes. Uh, did anybody want to make a, a 10 second comment, and then I'm going to turn it over to Austin? Go ahead, Veda. Go. Yes, yeah, so this is about what I would call the small circle of life in things mattering. 
in the in things mattering that you might not expect. So, and I'm going to kind of go out on a limb on this one, but I will bet money that if someone spent time with David Taylor, really trying to understand his current passion for issues of diversity and what sort of shaped that, I will bet you one story in that list of anecdotes is David, um, his first manager, his first brand manager, when he transferred from uh, the paper plant to uh, brand management being Paul Alexander, an African-American who is just um, really smart. I'm biased, I'm a college classmate, lots of integrity in someone who David still has a relationship with today, even though they're, they've gone through you know many sort of very different lives. But this idea that little things matter and someone like a random sort of choice of David having a black brand manager. And I can guarantee you in the sort of uh, late eighties when that occurred, that was not common. And how that potentially has impacted him so that he can be a white ally, but often folks aren't born white allies. There are seminal experiences 